while we're talking about the Holy Spirit, this is my last lesson on the Spirit of Truth. This is part eight. And how many enjoyed last week if you were here? Uh, Raymond Pettit was here, and uh, he's with Cleansing Stream, and I appreciate him coming. He had a great word last week, so uh, I was going to do this last week. But here we are, the last lesson in a series. For those that don't know, I, uh, I teach in series usually. Sometimes I have a little standalone, what we call messages, but generally they're in series. And I'm talking about the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit's work in our life. And, uh, and I want to talk to you today about some things that are very, very personal to me. In fact, I was praying yesterday and the word infomercial came to me. You ever seen an infomercial? That guy's all excited because he's got a new product and, and he won't tell you about it to start with. You got to listen for 25 minutes. And finally, well, if you'll call this number, you can get a bottle of blah, blah, blah for $29.95 and it'll change your life forever. Well, I got something better than any infomercials ever talk, told you about. And I'm not going to wait till the end to tell you. I'm going to tell you in the middle of it. But it's something that's revolutionary. They all didn't even laugh at that. I guess it wasn't funny. <laughs> but um, anyway, it's something that's revolutionized my life. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit. There are two works of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. Everybody say two works of the Holy Spirit in my life. When we are born again, he comes and lives inside of us, just like water is in this, hope, hope, there it is, water is in this bottle right here, and I've used that as an illustration week after week. Uh, the Holy Spirit's in you when you're born again, and he changes your character, changes your nature from darkness to light, from lying to truth. Uh, and uh, he's just that way, from the power of Satan unto God, he places in us the, the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and long-suffering and all that. And uh, he places God's love in us. He places an assurance in us. And, and he places in us a desire to do right. Isn't that awesome? And that's the first thing I noticed when I came back to Jesus. I didn't want to do the things I'd done in the past. I wanted something inside of me compelled me to change. Has anybody noticed that about you? And if you go, go, try to go back into the paths you used to walk in, there's somebody inside that says, uh, you don't want to do that. Stop. Because he doesn't want to go there. Where you go, he goes. So there's the work of the Holy Spirit uh, the indwelling in the new birth, but then there's also the baptism, the baptism. Everybody say baptism. The Greek word baptizo means to immerse in something. And so it's a transliterated word from English to, from Greek to English, uh, baptism. Baptizo means to place something into something. So, you know, I can baptizo this bottle into, uh, uh, oil. And guess what? It's got oil around. Or I could baptizo this bottle into water, and, and, and that's the illustration I normally use, and this water, bottle has water in it. That's synonymous with the new birth, right? With the Holy Spirit being in us. But when I put it in a, foot, a, a, a tub of water, then water surrounds this bottle, and that's what happens with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're immersed in a cocoon of Holy Spirit all around you. And it's really an amazing phenomenon Jesus told the disciples not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. Acts 1 verse 5, uh, John baptized with water, but you'll be, or John immersed in water, but you'll be immersed in Holy Spirit not many days from now. So he told that to the disciples. They waited another 10 days after his ascension to heaven and on the day of Pentecost, the Jewish feast days, the Holy Spirit fell just like Jesus said he would. It was dramatic. It was odd. It was strange. A wind filled the building. A, you know, looked like fire lit upon, sat upon each person. It's really strange. It's, uh, it's quite a phenomenon you read, and it doesn't make sense to the natural mind, but that's what the Bible says happened. And the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? Now, we've taken time in this uh, in these series of lessons, we've talked about the work of the Holy Spirit moving us away. How many know you need the Holy Spirit's work in your life today, every day? He moved, we've talked about Him moving us away from deception to revealing the deceptions in the world. And the stronger the, stronger the deceptions get, the more uh, discernment you should have. Yes or no? Because the Holy Spirit lives in you. We talked about how He can help you gravitate through difficult times. You know, we gravitate towards, uh, we try to bring our pain into pleasure. And the Holy Spirit will bring you into the presence of God when you're having a difficult time. We've talked about Him being our coach and our helper in life. And then we've taken the last, this is number four, last three uh, times I've spoke, I've talked about the baptism with the Holy Spirit in detail. And if you'll go through, see, I was raised Southern Baptist, and they never talked about the baptism with the Holy Spirit in the denominational church that I attended. 
So if you were Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopal, Lutheran, Catholic, well, some Catholic might talk about it. Let me think. Anything else you want? Any of the mainline denominations that aren't Pentecostal denominations do not talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes or no? You know they don't. I never heard a word about it. Not one word. My mother in 1975 as a Southern Baptist lady received this experience. I've mentioned this in the past. Uh, in, a, in a prayer meeting, and it revolutionized her life. And my two brothers and my father and I watched her change over a period of time after she received this experience in February 1975. Then the next year, 1976, I, as an almost 18-year-old, received the ba- uh, came back to Jesus, received the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And y'all, it just revolutionized my life. That's all I can say. I didn't know anything about it. I just thought, man, life is different. And it's been different for over 45 years now. And uh, so uh, that's the, the good news I have to share with you. And I want to talk to you about walking in the light of this experience. I'm trying to summarize. Everybody listening? Yeah. All right. So I'm just summarizing some things. So we uh, had a lesson here a couple of weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago, and I, I went through the book of Acts every single time it talks about the baptism with the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, a few years after the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 9, actually, you don't think about it much, but how many know the, the apostle Paul, whose name was Saul, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, when, when a disciple named Ananias laid hands on him. He received the baptism with the Holy Spirit, and he came back, he came to Jesus. It was a, a crazy experience for him. Acts chapter 10, in a, in a Gentile's house, Cornelius, uh, is how his house, uh, Paul, Peter was preaching. The Holy Spirit fell on on, on non-Jewish people, and at the time, 10 years past Pentecost, they didn't even think, the Jews didn't think that uh, God would have anything to do with anybody but Jews. And how many know that were completely wrong? Aren't you glad he'll deal with you? And then we looked at Acts chapter 19, that's 20 years past Acts 2, and there were some believers in modern-day Turkey and Ephesus, and they were still following John the Baptist. Paul preached Jesus to them. They got born again. They got baptized with water and he laid hands on them and they were received the Holy Spirit. Now here's a phenomenon that comes with the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And this is what I want to talk to you about today. With the experience, the baptism with the Holy Spirit comes a phenomenon called speaking in other languages. Now the King James Version of the Bible says speaking in other tongues and most people when they hear that cringe. Oh my Lord, we're in that kind of church. What are we going to do now? We're stuck. Well, just calm down. It's okay. We're not crazy and cuckoo. But I do want to talk to you about that experience. I've spent uh, about 16,500 days of my life. I know it's weird that I even counted them. Am I obsessive compulsive or what? But that's a lot of days. That's most of my, that's, you know, that's most of my life. That's, it's all but, you know, 18 years of it anyway. Praying in the Spirit every single... I do this every day. Uh, uh, I'm still logical. I think logically, or some people may, may not think I do, but I do. And, you know, I, you know, I reason. I, I do normal things with everybody. But there's an element of my life that's connected with God with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I pray in the Spirit every day. And I'm, I, I, I took some time the last time. This is October 31st. I've got 10 reasons that you should pray in the Spirit. And what you'll find out in the book of Acts, every... Every biblical reference of people receiving this experience called the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Everybody say, baptism with the Holy Spirit. Every single biblical uh, uh, biblical narrative that we have about that experience, every single person that received that experience prayed in the Spirit. Or prayed in tongues or spoke in the unknown tongue. All those are synonymous with the same experience. that's, That's something that goes along with it. You know, if you buy a shoe, the shoe has a tongue in it. Well, and you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, speaking in another language comes with it. Now, you can exercise that. Some people are baptized with the Holy Spirit, and they say, well, I haven't got that language yet you talked about. Well, if you don't, it's uh, one of two reasons. Either, number one, you didn't understand the experience, so you didn't really receive. Or, number two, if you did understand the experience and you didn't receive, you, you got to learn how to yield to him. He's not just going to burst out. Here's what you don't have to be concerned about. You don't have to be concerned if, that if you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're at the bank or you're doing some business somewhere or you're somewhere, uh, uh, okay, you're, you're at Chick-fil-A and, and you're getting your favorite salad and they open the window and you go to pay them and, and you go, that will not happen. (laughs) 
Because it's under your control. Now, I've done this over 16,000 days. It's never happened to me one time. I'm in total control. I can start it. I can stop it. If I'm in, around people that I don't think understand, I will say not one word. If I'm at another church, if I'm attending a Baptist church or a Methodist church or some other church that doesn't preach or teach this experience, you guess what I do? I don't do that because they will think I'm cuckoo because they just don't understand, right? So uh, I'm just trying to explain again that you have full control with this. At the same time, there's a measure of release to the Lord that you experience with the baptism with the Holy Spirit. So there are 10 reasons every believer should play in the Spirit. I've, I've covered three of those on October 31st. All of this is on our website. Number one, the first reason is it's God's will for every believer to pray uh, in the spirit or in other tongues. I covered that and I'm not going to cover that again. We talked about it before. Number two, this experience of being able to pray in the spirit helps unseat the control of the unrenewed mind over your life. Your mind, your, your, your mind is, is accustomed to controlling everything about you, bodily functions, uh, your ability to con, uh, to, to concentrate and and drown out distractions and haunt in and concentrate on one thing. Your mind does that all day long. Our minds protect our lives from danger, right? And so that's, that's a good thing. You don't turn your mind off with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, when you pray in the Spirit, there's an element of you that you have to let go to God and do something that seems so outlandishly peculiar that is that is so... That is so different than anything you've ever experienced. And what it does is opens up an avenue of spiritual fellowship with Jesus. That is absolutely incredible. In fact, so question, can you have deep fellowship with Jesus without this experience? Answer, of course. Will you be enriched and have a deeper fellowship with Jesus with this experience? You see what I'm saying? So I just want to talk to you about something that will enhance your spiritual life. How many know we never live beyond our prayer life? I got to calm down, slow down a minute. How many, you never live beyond it. Your prayer life determines where you go in life. If you don't pray, your flesh and the enemy takes over. You ever thought, now a lot of believers, they don't pray much and they wonder why... Things happen and things don't turn out well. You got to pray. We live in a dark world. We live in a fallen world. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, Jeremiah said, Jeremiah 17, 9. And then there are demon spirits, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age and spiritual wickedness in high places. And they've been plotting against you and your family for generations. And they just want to see if you're a pawn that they can topple over. And they can do to you what they did to your, the previous generations in your family. You got to learn to fight that off. If you just innocuously say, well, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, and you do nothing, you'll be whipped. That didn't go over big. Is that true? Most believers in America forget we're in a fight. We're in an army. We're the army of God. You're a soldier in the army of God. A soldier sells out. He has no right of his own. Somebody tells him when to get up, what to eat, when to, when to bathe, when to put his britches on, or when to go to battle and what to do or when to do it. And you know what? We're so independent-minded in America that we don't walk with Jesus very well because we let our freedoms that we have because of our constitution so invade our spiritual life that we're going we're gonna to act towards the Lord like we act towards others. And you can't do that and be successful as a believer. You got to sell out. And if you don't sell out, what I mean by selling out, that means you're willing to obey God, period, even if it hurts. Sometimes it doesn't feel good to obey God. Sometimes it doesn't feel good to suck it up when somebody's blasting you with their spit on your face and they're mad at you. And God says, don't say a word, love them. That's not fun. Or you're at Thanksgiving. Yeah, I know, you know what I'm going to say. And there's some undercurrents, and boy, you feel them the moment you walk in the door. It's like, mm. And you had a conversation with whoever on the way. Man, I don't want to go here today, but I'm doing my duty. I'm doing my duty. Doing my duty. See, if you're a believer, you'll do your duty with grace and space and 
you know, they'll open the door and say, I'm so glad to, and, and you're not just saying it, you mean, I'm so glad to see you. God bless you. How you doing? Give them a big old hug. Or maybe a fist pump, whatever you're comfortable with. You get it? I'm just saying you got to sell out. But this, uh, this helps you unseat the control of the unrenewed mind that it exerts over your spiritual life. The baptism of the Holy Spirit will. There'll be an element of consecration that you'll enter into that's different once you receive this experience and you're able to pray in the Spirit every day. Number three, I mentioned this last time, it provides a way for you to pray about things that you don't know about. Now, to me, that's one of the, that's a big deal to me. I don't know much and you don't, neither do you. There's a lot of stuff around. And to be able to pray about things that are unknown to you things about the future, things that, that are happening now that you don't know about that may affect you in some way. I don't know how to, I can't put a price on that. There's, there's no monetary price to put on that. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 mentioned this last time, Amplified New Testament. Y'all hear y'all quiet. For one who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men but God. No one understands or catches his meaning because in the Holy Spirit he utters, now I love this, secret truths. And hidden things not obvious to the understanding. So the things about life that we don't know about, but see, praying in the Spirit helps you pray about things that are coming, relationships that you may enter into, things that will be occurring, things that are happening right now that you don't know about that may eventually affect you in some way. Helps you pray about all those things. Is that valuable? Would it be valuable to be able to pray that way? Well, obviously, yes. 1 Corinthians 2.11 says, For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man In him, even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. You know, uh, understand this. We we have a a mental dimension to life. And you can meet people and they're just so mental. That's their world. Thoughts. Or you can meet people and, and they're very emotional. Our younger generation is taught to think with emotion, not logic. Did you know that? Did you know in our schools, our colleges, our universities right now, the kind of learning you had if you're my age is not what's happening now. So it's absent of values. A lot of it's absent of logic. Not all of it, some of it has some logic. But nonetheless, it's a real problem. But the spirit, there are those who... Tune into the spirit. My goal is to have a sound mind, to train my emotions to obey me so I don't obey them all the time. They'll make you crazy. And then my other goal in life is is while I'm tooling through life, I want to listen to Jesus. I want to listen for the Holy Spirit. What's he saying? What's he saying about what I'm dealing with? What's he saying about the relationship I'm in? What's he saying about the business deal I'm about to enter into? The house I'm about to buy? The automobile I'm about to purchase? The person I'm about to marry? The person I'm having lunch with? What I'm doing with my private time? You know, I want to live where he has a sway and has a say. How about you? I uh, got one thing um, under this... uh, Provides a way for you to pray about things you don't know about. And I mentioned this. I want to mention this and just move off. I got all these other points. I'll finish today, by the way. Um, in 1993, it was the second week of December. I didn't look up the date. I don't have the date in my head. I just know it was the second Monday of December, 1993. And I was in my hometown, Florence, South Carolina. You've heard me say this, but I want to express what I'm expressing is this works with both spiritual things and natural things. Uh, that is, praying in the Spirit helps you pray about everything. I finished praying in the Spirit, and uh, I think I, I talked about this on a Sunday morning, I think, but I'm going to do it again quickly. I was in my bathroom, I was shaving, and I heard, go check your oil. Now, I'm saying this because two weeks ago, I was in Myrtle Beach at a convention, and at the convention, a man walked up to me, and he said, do you know who I am? And for the first time since 1994, I laid my hands on this man. I laid my hands, I laid my eyes on this man. I didn't touch him. (laughs) And he said, you know who I am? I said, yes, you're the man that fixed my automobile in 1993. He said, that's right. I met this man. So here I am praying 1993, second Monday in December. And in in, right here, floating up from inside of me, go check your oil. I had a a van at the time. I had bought brand new. 
And uh, anyway, go check your oil. It went up three or four times to my mind, so I did it. I went outside uh, before I went to where I was going. I upped the hood, pulled out the dipstick. When I did, you got oil and water mixture sludge on the dipstick. That is a bad idea on Monday morning at 7 o'clock. And I made a beeline to this man I talked to two weeks ago. And he said, well, your, um, your head gasket is burst in your engine. Oil and water is mixed. Had you gone any further than just to my shop, you, you would have had to put a new engine in your van. At the time, I had, I had four chilling, and I couldn't afford an engine. You get that? So uh, instead, it cost me 440 U.S. dollars. And I told that man, thank you. So how did I get that, praying in the Spirit? What if I hadn't been praying in the Spirit? What if I'd just been going like I normally do and didn't have any way of knowing anything other than what somebody's told me? Guess what? I would have put a new engine in my vehicle. Did you hear what I just said? So is there value in praying in the Spirit, both natural and spiritual? I've got all kinds of things. I was about to get on an airplane. I was between uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, and, uh, and I had a British Airways flight to um, an airport in London, England. What's the other? Not uh, Gatwick. What is it? Is it Gatwick? What? He, no, the other one. Gatwick. I was going to Gatwick that time for some reason. Usually go to Heathrow. And, uh, and I, you know, I was getting ready and I had some people with me. Sean Tracy was with me. And, uh, and, and midway through the flight, I got to feeling terrible. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Now, you see, his voice is different. It's, it's more authoritative, it's stronger, because I'd been praying in the Spirit. I'd, it was a Sunday morning, I'd already preached. And um, I heard him say, I hear, floated up from inside, don't get on the next flight until you know what's wrong with you. Now, he had some intonation to those words, and the intonation told me, I heard it. It's like somebody talking to me in a very sobering tone. Don't you do it. I stepped one step off the plane. A Delta representative, I said, I'm in trouble. Help. She put me in a wheelchair, whisked me to triage. I fainted. My appendix had burst. I don't think I would have survived the flight to London because the um, poison had already entered my abdominal cavity. I was in the hospital nine days and had five antibiotics and got over it. The doctor told me you lived 100 years ago, you'd be dead right now. I said, appreciate the encouragement. Thank you. <laughs> it's not 100 years ago, yahoo. But I made it. See, see what praying in the Spirit will do? Now, if I had not been praying in the Spirit, I just wonder if I'd have heard the voice of God. So that's just something we want to think about. It provides a way for you to pray about things you don't know about. Number four, uh, praying in the Spirit provides a way for you to charge yourself up spiritually. You ever feel depleted? You ever feel wasted? Even after you, after a vacation, it's like, man, I'm just, I feel awful, tired. You ever been that way? Of course you have. Everybody has. See, strength is not just physical, it's spiritual. A.B. Simpson, a guy I read after he died in 1919, he said this, all physical strength, listen to this, is spiritual in cause. You're not right spiritually, you have a hard time physically, mentally, and emotionally. You feel like weights are on you. Anybody ever experienced that besides me? Yeah. Provides a way for you to charge yourself up spiritually. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He who speaks in a tongue or in the unknown language edifies or builds himself up, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Jude 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying... In the Holy Spirit. That's not just talking about praying with a little more unction and a little more fervency. Let's talk about, let's talk, pray, let's talk about praying in that language the Holy Spirit gives with the baptism with the Holy Spirit. You know, we, we're surrounded with negative things constantly, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it takes spiritual power to overcome that. Yes or no? Uh, and, and you just, and the only way to do it is, is build yourself up. You know, you've got a battery in your vehicle. And that battery is, uh, there are two wires, a black wire and a red wire. And that red wire is attached to an alternator. And that alternator is uh, turned by a belt in your engine. And as long as your engine is running, that alternator is pushing a current into your battery. And you're, it's preparing your battery for the next time there's a, there's a demand on it. I mean, once you turn the ignition, and thank God there's some, there's some amperage in that battery, right? And now's the season... If you got a bad battery, you go, you go to turn and click, 
click, click, and then somebody's got to help you out. Well, you know, spiritually speaking, we got a lot of click, click, clicks going on. That is, the demands of life are on us. We feel challenged. We don't have the spiritual energy we need to overcome. That's where praying in the Spirit comes in. It does exactly what the alternator does to your battery in your engine. It charges you. Not a physical charge, it's a spiritual thing. Uh, before I preach, I got up this morning at 4.30. I poured me a cup of coffee. I went upstairs. I sat at the desk. I do that every Sunday. And uh, I, I read my notes. And I read and I read for a while. And then for two hours, I prayed in the Spirit. And it does, sometimes I just get dry mouth. I carry me a bottle of water with me and I just drink the bottle of water. Sometimes I feel something. Most of the time I feel nothing, but there's a spiritual charge that's happening. I start every day that way. I start every day praying in the Spirit in the morning because I need spiritual energy for that day. If you come up short and the flesh is waylaying you and hindering you in life, you, you might want to consider uh, in your life, if you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, receiving that experience and going to the next stage and allowing that, that spiritual language to flow out of your belly like Jesus said in John 7. Rivers of living water and pray in the Spirit because they'll charge you up. And they help you overcome the flesh. How many hear me? Anyway, I do this every day, getting ready, ready for every day. That's, that's as important to me as putting my, my clothes on, is praying in the Spirit. Number five, it provides a way to be uh, refreshed spiritually. Everybody say refreshed. Isaiah 28, 11, and 12, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. The Old Testament people, he said, yet they would not hear. So stammering lips and another tongue. See, there's a prophecy. Probably 700 years or so before it happened. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the ensuing ability to pray in the Spirit, prophesied in the Old Testament, right? There's stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. Now, there is a spiritual refreshment that comes Praying in the Spirit. Now, you know, if you hung around with me all day one day, well, you'd say, well, you're really, you're a different person. I said, well, probably. So everybody would say that about themselves. But I can just tell you that if I'm in my truck going somewhere, if it's a, you know, 20, 30 minute ride, I, I'm, I'm probably either listening to the Word, listening to a podcast, or uh, praying or singing in the Spirit. If you can pray in the Spirit, you can sing in the Spirit. Yeah. Sometimes I take hymns I know or songs I know and, and instead of singing the English words, I sing in the Spirit. So what does it do? Uh, this is the refresh, rest with which you may cause the weary to rest and this is the refreshing. I mean, you know, there's a refreshment that comes in the presence of God you'll find nowhere else. That's why Americans are so tired right now. I mean, this stuff weighs on you every day, doesn't it? You've got to find a well to drink out of. It keeps you up spiritually, keeps you built up, and it's praying in the Spirit. Provides a way to be refreshed spiritually. Number six, it magnifies God in your life. Two connotations to that. Acts 10, 46, they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Well, magnifying God, we just sang today. We, what did we do? We magnify God. We extolled His name. We worshiped Him because He's just such a magnificent person you know, we built him up another way. You know, what does a magnifying glass do? It makes something small look bigger, right? So when you magnify God, you make him bigger than all the opposing thoughts, the opposing feelings, the circumstances around you. It helps you magnify God. I can tell you, when I'm going through a hard place, and that's often the case for anybody, obviously for me, it helps me keep God where he needs to be in my life. Uh, my problems are not bigger than me. My problems are not bigger than God. If my problems are not bigger than God, the guy I'm going to overcome those problems because me and him are in tandem. Yes or no? <laughs> I'm telling, magnifies God. So the enemy say, you go, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. You just have to say, shut up. Because here's, here's what God says. And see, when you pray in the Spirit, you just, it just reminds you that greater is He who is in you than He who is in the world. It keeps you aware of the presence of God. 
Uh, and so I'm tooling through day in, in my day. I'm walking here, going there, doing business and that. You, you, if, if you got real close to me, because you'd probably never tell it, I'm praying in the spirit most all the time. Un, you know, kind of under my, you don't have to be loud. Some people, you know, uh, certain nations I've been to doing missions trips, it, it seems like they think the louder you are, the more spiritual you are and the more God will hear you. Because I've had some places I had to put cotton in my ears because I wanted to hear after I left the meeting. And if you've traveled any, you know what I mean. And if you haven't traveled to those places, you probably don't want to enter a meeting like that because it's ear piercing. But I'm just saying God doesn't hear you because you're loud or soft. He hears your heart and he hears your faith. Is that true? But I pray in the spirit real low, real light, real soft. Just throughout the day. Why? It keeps me aware of the presence of God. Help keep, helps keep the flesh under. And when thoughts come in a millisecond, it ca- helps me quantify those thoughts. Oh, that's of the devil. That's not godly. I'm not listening. And I'm not thinking about it. It keeps me aware. It keeps me aware of who is inside of me. I'm not living my life by myself. I got a king inside me. I got a ruler inside of me. I got the person who, who created the universe on the inside of me. What, is he on the inside of you? Yes. Well, it keeps you aware. Number seven, it provides a way to offer praise and thanksgiving to God. First Corinthians 14, 16 and 17. Otherwise, praying in the Spirit again offers a way to offer praise and thanksgiving to God. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit. How will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. So you got a lunch engagement with somebody, you got a your nice restaurant, you're sitting down and, and they look at you and say, well, you pray over the food. Uh, what I wouldn't do is pray in tongues. Because when you open your eyes, everybody's going to be looking and saying, what kind of cuckoo person is that? No, I pray in English. But it says you give thanks well. Uh, I had this experience when I came to the Lord over 45 years ago. Uh, you know, there's just something about the Lord. You can't, sometimes you just don't have words to say how, how you think and how you feel. And sometimes when he does things, he's, you know, he's just from the depths of your heart. You just want to say, you just feel like you want to say more than thank you. It's like, I'm indebted to you. I'm, my whole life is yours. It's like, you didn't have to do that to me. Thank you. And when I first got filled with the Spirit, I just took time to say, God, I don't have to say what I want to say, but I just tore it. I just started praying in the Spirit. And you know, for the first time in my life, I felt like I said everything I needed to say. You hear me? Praying in the Spirit is a great way to offer praise and thanksgiving. I'd say when you're by yourself. Number eight, I mentioned this before, helps you control your tongue, James 3, 2. Indeed, we all make mistakes for if you contr- if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. Do you know if you can control your mouth, you can control your life? Jesus said, "You <laughs> talking to religious people, he didn't mince words either. You brood of snakes. How could evil men like you speak what is good and right for whatever is in your heart is determined by what you say? A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. You know, you can tell what's in a person's heart by what they say. I hear people say this, oh, he's a good boy. Oh, he's a good man. But there's nasty coming out of his mouth. Right? I better leave that one alone. And I'll tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. So words, 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 words. See, praying in the Spirit helps you control that, that thing above your chin and below your nose that sometimes just gets out of whack. Helps you control it. Um, I'm going to come back to number nine, number 10, because I want to spend some time on it. Number 10 provides a door, uh, number 10, praying in the Spirit provides a doorway for other spiritual gifts. To manifest, several of the men of God of yesteryear that I have read after frequently have said, all of them have said basically the same thing. The more you pray in the Spirit, the more there will be a manifestation of spiritual gifts. The less you pray in the Spirit, the less there will be a manifestation of spiritual gifts. Most people don't know what I mean by spiritual gifts. They're enumerated and listed in 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. There are nine of them. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, uh, discerning of spirits, the gift of faith, the working of miracles, the gifts of healings, uh, 
different kinds of tongues, interpretation, tongues, and prophecy. Now, in my podcast, I've gone over in the past every single one of them in detail with biblical references. If you want to know about those gifts, go back to my podcast, MitchHorton.com. They're there. Nonetheless, they should operate in the lives of people baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yes or no? Yes or no? How many are hungry for spiritual gifts? Don't raise your hand because most people don't even think about them. Paul said, covet earnestly. Be zealous for spiritual gifts. Most believers never even give it a a thought. I pray every day for the manifestation of spiritual gifts worldwide in believers all over the world. Do you? You should. And then you ought to say, God, I'm open. Let the Holy Spirit work through me. Number, uh, And then the last one, in my notes it's number nine, but today it's number 10. Uh, Praying in the Spirit provides a way to pray God's perfect will. I'll end with this one. Listen to this, Romans 8, 26 and 27. Uh, Some of this is often quoted, but out of context. Listen to this. Likewise, the Spirit helps our weaknesses. What are our weaknesses? Here it is. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought or should, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, let me tell you what that's not saying. It's not saying that the Holy Spirit's responsible for your prayer life. Somebody said one day, said, well, I don't do a whole lot of praying anymore because I read Romans 8, 26, and it says the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. So since he's doing the praying for me, I got it made. No, you're stupid. That's not what it's saying. No, no, what it's saying is he assists you when you pray. It says uh, again, uh, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with our aid, he helps us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That with groanings which cannot be uttered, uh, original language Greek would, would bear uh, inarticulate speech. It's talking about your regular kind of speech. Groanings which cannot be uttered is a specific reference to praying in the Spirit. Then verse 27, now he who searches the heart knows what the mind or will of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So the inference there is when you pray in the Spirit, you're praying according to the will of God. Let me ask you a question. Is there any value in praying according to the will of God? Yes? Well, then is there any value in praying in the Spirit? Obvious. Then verse 28 is often taken out of context, but the context is the previous two verses. We are assured and know that God, in fact, New Living, we start there first. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. We often quote that, and that's true. Aren't you glad that's true? But the reason that's true is because of verses 26 and 27. Because the person's praying, and because the person's praying according to the will of God, and because the person's praying with the help of the Holy Spirit by praying in the Spirit, and because when you pray in the Spirit, you're praying the will of God, then all things work together for good. And Amplified says this, we are assured to know that God being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Now, I can give you, I could, I, really, I could stay here a long time, but we don't have that time. And talk to you about my life and how praying in the Spirit has, has guided me, led me, and I wouldn't be here without Him helping me. 1984, January 1984, I'm praying in the Spirit. I go to work at a big church. You've heard me say this. There was a guy who was associate pastor of the church. He was a retired uh, um, colonel in the armed forces, just a man's man, and uh and I would see him, and I'd go to work and see him. And, and the moment I laid eyes on him one day, I heard, you're going to have his job. Oh, my Lord Jesus. Full of pride. But every time I saw him, you'll have his job. I mean, it bothered me so bad. I went home told Susan. We had, uh, uh, we didn't have any, she was pregnant with my first child at the time. I said, Susan, something's wrong with me. I'm full of pride. I said, every time I look at, at George Moss is the man's name. I said, um, some tells him I'm going to have his job. Something's wrong. You need to pray for me. I'm full of pride. I told a friend. I told another friend, you need to pray for me. Every time I, I see George, uh, something tells him I'm going to have his job. Nine months later, I had his job. Not the associate pastor part of the church, but the other thing he did. I had his job. It floored me. And you know what that taught me? The Holy Spirit will show you things to come. Is that not awesome? 
telling me. I mentioned a few weeks ago, 1993, I was pastoring another man's church for him while it was, he was on a missions trip for one year with his family. And I heard three words, already existing church. God told me I'd be going to take over a church that was in existence when that guy came back to his church. And it happened a year, not 11 months later, I was here. See, I got that by praying in the spirit. Uh, 2013, we were on Garner Road in, um, not Garner Road, we were on Aversboro Road in Garner and uh, had been in that building for a number of years and needed more property, needed more space. And the board and I had looked, I don't, I don't know how many pieces of property, looked, maybe 25 or more. We looked and nothing seemed to fit right. So we had our eyes on a building on Highway 70 in Garner. And, uh, you know, we made contact with the owners. They met in my office with the board and I and uh, determined that we could buy the property. But it had quite a big old price tag on it to buy it, upfit, do everything we needed to do. Really expensive for us as a, you know, a medium-sized church. And I thought, wow. Anyway, we were believing God. And in 2013, the first Tuesday, now I've been praying in the Spirit. That's the context. First Tuesday of... Um, of 2013, uh, the first day back into the office after the new year came in, I was driving by that piece of property and I had uh, just a, um, I just had a habit when I'd go by there. I'd, even if somebody is in the vehicle with me, I say stop. If they're I, if they're talking, I say stop. And I'd say out loud, Lord, thank you for a miracle, a miracle of contract and a miracle of finance to get that building right there. Every time, I, and so that morning, Tuesday morning, first Tuesday of uh, of January. I was, I, I turned left onto 70 from Hammond Road, turned left, and here I was, and, and I, I said, Lord, and when I said, Lord, I heard him. I'd been praying in the Spirit just prior to that. I heard him say, here's what I heard him say. Now, you say, Mitch, what, what does it sound like? I, all I can tell you is it comes from in here. It's an impression. Here's what I heard. Now, you can pray for this building if you want to, but if you let me, I'll give you something better. I said, Really? Really? And I thought a minute said, on one condition. See, you can bargain with God if you're on the right link, wavelength with him. I said, you do this in a way that I don't lift my hand to get it, and I'll take my faith off this bill. He said, done. I said, all right. Now, this is weird. A few days later, I broke my arm riding my bicycle on the Noose River Trail. My hum humerus, one of the biggest bones in your body. Couldn't go to in, uh, Africa as I had planned. And this man right over here called me. Did you call me, Robert? Said, funny thing, I got a call from a businessman who owns this property. And I want you to go look at this property. And because I was here and not way over yonder in Africa, we bought this building. See, when you have stuff like that, and then I said, Lord, you're mighty good. When you have stuff like that happens, you just know there's a God in heaven that loves you. Did you hear me? Now, how did I get that praying in the Spirit? Praying in the Spirit. Let me tell you this, October 6th, and I've shared this, but listen. That's why I'm not too disturbed about anything. All, all this stuff that's happening in the world, I knew it was going to happen before it happened. I didn't know what it was. I'm praying in the Spirit, October 6th, 2019, right down here. I'm sitting on a stool. I'm praying in the Spirit. Now, everybody here is praying. I'm praying in the Spirit. Now, spiritual gift manifest. Different kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues. It came on me. It sounded like I was speaking German all of a sudden. I've heard people speak German. I've never spoken German. I can't tell you one word. Well, maybe a couple. But I knew that's, it sounds like a Germanic language. And then from that came out of my mouth interpretation. There, there will come an occurrence that will deeply affect this nation, United States, comma, and, the cat, and it will be a catalyst for Joel 2.28 to be fulfilled. Joel 2.28 says, and it will come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will, will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. On oh, my servants and handmaidens, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. Friends, 
So when this happened in March of 2020, COVID and all that, you know what? I, my, my, immediately inside me, that's what you prayed out October 6th, 2019, when this thing unfolded. Now, you know what we're going into right now? A move of God. Are you ready for it? You better get ready. I was praying. I've told you this several times. Uh, just before March 15th, that's when the world shut down with COVID-19, shut North Carolina down. Churches shut down. Our church shut down. Everybody good? I'm almost done. And, um, and I was just praying and I was praying about this COVID-19 thing I had heard on the news. I didn't know what it was. It just started. It just happened. Governor's about to shut the state down. I heard the word. And I was been praying in the spirit for a period of time. And, um, God bless you. You left my place. Uh, I heard the word nefarious. If you go look up the word, nefarious, it'll tell you all kinds of pretty rough stuff. What is the definition for nefarious? Hang on. There it is. Look at, listen to this. Here are the synonyms. Wicked, evil, sinful, iniquitous, villainous, criminal, heinous, Atrocious, appalling, abhorrent, vile, foul, base, abominable, odious, depraved, corrupt, shameful, scandalous, monstrous, fiendish, diabolical, devilish, unholy, ungodly, infernal, satanic, dark, unspeakable, despicable, outrageous, shocking, disgraceful, knavish, dastardly, egregious, flagitious. That ain't good. Now, what did that tell me? See, if you pray in the Spirit, it just gives you perspective on everything. You get what I'm saying? I'm trying to show you. If you pray in the Spirit, God will show you stuff that affects you. Well, this affected me. You know what I didn't do? I didn't get upset. Did I get mad? Oh, I got mad. Oh, yeah. I smelled devil all over there. But I also knew the Antichrist Spirit's using this as a tool to control the nations of the world, the commerce of the world, to, to, to move things towards what he wants is to control everybody. But see, God's already spoken to me. And you know, I can talk about this, whether I get aggravated about it or not, how it affects me, how uncomfortable it is, how aggravating it is, in all the various ways it is. But I know at the end result of this, there's going to be a move of God. And I want to be in it. How about you? So instead of looking at all the booger behind every bush and all the bad things, I'm thinking, God, you're up to something big in me and in us, and I'm excited. You're praying in the Spirit. What does it do? It gives you perspective on life. Say, so what's going to happen in the future? I don't know, but you know what? I expect God to show me anything I need to know that affects me. I heard Kenneth Hagin say this when I was a young man, and I'm done here. Uh, he said, um, I go as much by what God doesn't say as what he does say. So if God's not speaking to you, keep doing what you know to do. Keep loving God. Keep reading the word. Keep praying. Uh, stay close to your spouse. Love your children. Love your friends. Do your work hard. Work as under the Lord. Do what you know to do. Fulfill your life responsibilities. And just don't quit. How many hear me? So what about right now? Well, he hasn't said anything major to me lately. Except I know we're at the time just before Jesus is coming back. And I know all this is coming to pass. And we're going to have a big move of the Holy Spirit. A lot of the church isn't ready. So here's what I know. God's coming after you and me. He's coming for your flesh. He's coming for your self-centered ways. He's coming for the uncommitted parts of you. He's saying, make a fresh commitment to me. Because when the power of God comes the way it's coming this time, just before Jesus comes back, it brings judgment with it. And I don't want anything in me to be judged. How about you? Remember Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5? They lied to God and died. I know it's a weird way to end this, isn't it? I know, right? It's like, oh my God. Oh, it's just time to clean up. But see, I'm excited about, I'm honestly excited about the future because I know where we're going.
I don't know how we're going to get there. I just know where we're going. See, that's what I'm saying, praying in the Spirit for you. You may be changing jobs. You may be changing whatever. There may be things ahead. God will speak to you. He'll talk to you. He'll show you things to come. That's what Jesus said in John 16. He'll show you things to come. Church is not just for Sunday morning. Jesus is not just for Sundays. He fits every day of the week. Every hour of the day. And he wants to mesh into your business decisions, your life decisions, your family, your marriage, your children, your grandchildren, all that you do, all that you are. He wants to be involved. And so the days of segmenting life are over.